Great, let's get started. Um, I'm Eunice Yoon. I'm uh, with CNBC. I'm the China correspondent. And I'm very excited to be here with the co-chairs of the forum. And as you all know now, this forum's theme has been to chart a new course by leveraging technology, science, as well as innovation. And so I think it's appropriate that now that we're winding down, that we really reflect on some of the conversations that we've been having here and think about what they really tell us about the future of innovation, science, as well as technology. So uh, first I'd like to introduce the panelists who at this stage you all well know. Cheng Wei, who is the head of DD. Yeah. And uh, Mitchell Baker, of course, with uh, Mozilla. Uh, also, uh, Nathan Blechar Zick, who, of course, is the CTO of Airbnb. Ken Hu of Huawei Technologies. Jeff Tarr with Digital Globe. And also, of course, Lee Ray Gong, who is uh, the head of CMC. So, um, just the first question that I wanted to start off um, looking forward for all of you. Um, if you had the power, you were granted the powers today to change one thing in the world that would have the greatest impact to ensure that the future was innovative and that the environment was appropriate to foster innovation, what would that be? What would you change? Please feel free to jump in. I'll Me? jump in, sure. <laughs> Um, well, after, after the past couple of days and, and meeting so many people that are really uh, doing cutting edge work, I think it's become very clear that we are capable of, of the innovation. The innovation is happening. Uh, it's really a question about um, the values and aligning on uh, in this world and as it changes and as we innovate, how do we roll out that change? Uh, and I think that's where some of the more complicated questions come up. I've been in a number of panels and so many good questions were raised about the implications of change. Uh, I think there's no question that the change is going to happen, but the I think as a society, what the one thing we need to do to make sure this innovation fully, that we get the full benefit of the innovation is to manage the dialogue about uh, the implications of the change. I think this has a lot to do with values. And I think uh, ideally government can play a role in helping to have an organized conversation about these values. Because these value-based conversations quickly become complex conversations. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be our, our biggest struggle managing all this change. Mm -hmm. I think Nathan makes a number of really good points. First of all, the innovation is happening. And this event really highlighted innovations that I was aware of and innovations that were new. Uh, with regard to values, I do think the values are critically important, especially as innovation requires global collaboration. Uh, and one place those values are really important is values with regard to cyber threats and privacy, which is, are essential building blocks to fueling the innovation that we need going forward. Oh, interesting. I, I would uh, add to that expanding the conversation to really supercharge innovation. We should uh, uh, either enable or give tools to more people. Like the set of people who are able to innovate now is growing, but still limited. And we have with the innovations and technology so far, vast new possibilities between 3D printing, the ability of digital information. We can make innovation available at a micro level. And so we can have a spectrum of innovation from the kinds of innovation we see here, which often requires high investment, high education, down to micro innovation for you know, the billions of people who are in desperate need of the ability to improve their own lives. And that, just one, that will both help with values because you have more people engaged and make the values discussion more complicated because you've got a larger set of humanity involved. Yeah, we've been uh, in a dis uh, discussion uh, about uh, innovation of, uh, on technology, innovation on the science, and uh, innovation on business model uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the past few days. And if, if I'm considering uh, what's going to be changed uh, in the future to in the future, um, I would say I will make the world more connected 
to make it as a super connected world. A super connected world means we're going to well, we're going to have more connections. From our observation, by the year of 2025, we're going to have a thousand billions of connections globally. And that will enable us to get all the things around us, including the, uh, your glasses, watches, shoes, and everything, and even including yourself, to be connected with each other. And a super connected world means you're going to have a faster um, speed connections super fast, which is 100 times faster than, than what we have today. That means you're going to download a high-definition video in a, in a second. And the super connected world means you're going to have a very lower latency, which means the network will re, 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 respond much, much faster than before. That means you, you're going to uh, make the uh, you know, uh, drive this car into the reality. So I believe a super connected world was uh, is what I really want to make. It's a, it's a big change. Okay. Oh, it, it's, it's quite an interesting question. Um, um, you know, I was involved in some uh, workshops and uh, panels in the past three days and, uh, and learned learn a lot. And actually, um, you know, because I, I come from the Chinese media, so people when, you know, facing this kind of question, people definitely will think about, you know, how about censorship? You know, that's the kind of the fundamental, you know, things happening in China. However, I do think, um, you know, um, um, the, I think the, the answer is I, you know, I always believe in creativity. So creativity can, I think, can, can surpass everything try to limit you. So, um, for example, um, the one, th one thing, um, or one, one debate in one of my, my, my panels is about the who is, who is going to play a more important role, it, um, editorial or, or technology. Mm. So, um, you, you know, um, the situation is traditional, traditional there, 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 there were a lot of, you know, TV stations, newspapers yeah. playing very, you know, influential role in the media space. And currently, um, you know, there, there are so many new platforms, especially the social networks. You know, um, and uh, traditional media should go through those social network to spreading, you know, to spread their, their, their information. So, and also yesterday I saw, I saw an article talking about, um, you know, the Chinese company Tencent is going to, to use the robotic uh, technology to produce news. You know, actually it's, it, it's already happened in U.S. And, uh, it's kind of, you know, the pro programmatic or robotic technology to, you know, news creation service. So in the future, you know, which one will be more important? Editorial side, you know, media inf influence, you know, very powerful. And right now, the platform, the channels, who plays more important role in the future? I think, you know, maybe both sides, you know, will continue to, to grow. However, I think, in this world, creativity is the most important. Creative or content, creative technology, creative of the connection, you know, would be the, you know, will take over all the boundaries, you know, limiting the, limiting the business. That's my, my, my thinking. So I would like to uh, speak uh, Mandarin. So you have to put on your earphones. So I'm from uh, China's uh, very uh, young uh, internet company. That is uh, DD. So we have changed our name to uh, DD Chuxing. So with our past three days in Davos, we talked a lot about uh, innovation. We are so happy. Innovation will change our future in the world. So what is the most important for our innovation? So I believe, so we have a lot of encouragement, stimulus of innovation uh, to be more, some of the uh, inclusiveness on the more encouragement to those uh, uh, failed people. We have uh, uh, public innovation, a lot of uh, uh, makers, a lot of entrepreneurs. We try to encourage not only the success, we will focus more on the process of innovation. So for most of the uh, uh, regulating environment, maybe it's appropriate for the previous uh, generation or the previous uh, century. So uh, in the innovation, so how to make it more adapted and adaptation to be more relaxed and also for those innovation and more follow up of this innovation, this is quite important.
need to have a more flexible environment, um, a change in values, <clears throat> making sure that there's much more connectivity and creativity. Uh, what happens to the global economy if in the next five years we do not have those? <laughs> Don't all jump in at once. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of impact well, do you think it will have on global growth if we have maybe some incremental changes, but not necessarily something that's so disruptive or something that would really dramatically change the field? I mean, I think simply put, there would be slower growth and I think uh, th that would come with kind of fits, you know, starts and stops. And I think it might not uh, be as um, inclusive as possible. Uh, you know, I think one of the themes that emerged from what I heard from folks saying is, is the idea of democratizing innovation, in including more people in the innovation process. Uh, and to further creativity, to solve problems that currently aren't being solved, but also in the process of engaging people in innovation, uh, getting them to come to the table and, and have that values-based conversation about the future. You know, I think so many people right now feel like they're not part of the innovation and that this is kind of happening to them and they feel more the victim, where I think the, the attitude that would be great to promote is have everybody be innovators, have everyone kind of be envisioning the future and being a part of creating that future. I believe the innovation we're seeing has the potential really to create a much better world and to solve the most complex problems we're facing today. If some of the changes you heard about today were to cease or go backwards or not move forward, uh, then I think it would lead to uh, a, a less stable world uh, and more, more people left in poverty, left in hunger. Uh, more, more refugees, uh, it would be an awful situation. So, but I, I prefer to be optimistic, and I am optimistic. I think this event gave us uh, plenty of reason for optimism. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd like to address this question uh, from, from a, another perspective, because um, uh, I'm quite optimistic about the future. And uh, what I'm, I'm considering is that uh, how to make sure all those Interruptive, in, interruption happen. So I, I believe the key is that to develop a more supportive relationship between some of the key elements for future innovation. I think there are three uh, key elements, technology, regulation, and business model. I think we need to develop a new model uh, um, which will give more support to each of the elements. For example, the regulation, um, can be an enabler for new business model. They can trigger a lot of, you know, a lot of you know, innovation in the business and the technology. And the te technology the innovation could be a key enabler for the business model innovation as well. And the business model innovation will really give a lot of guidance for the future technological innovation. So I think the key is to develop a more supportive framework for the future innovation. So how do you build that more supportive framework when, when you look around the world, s growth is slowing down. And when, s when growth slows, you tend to see companies maybe don't want to share as much information as governments, maybe are a little bit more suspicious of each other. So you're trying to build a lot of support. You're trying to create uh, connectivity. And how do you improve the trust? How do you build the trust? How do you ensure that there is enough trust in the system to overcome these, these obstacles? Yeah, I think uh, we need to, uh, to figure out what's the uh, uh, fundamental driving force for the framework. And I think the, the answer is the value. What's the value you're gonna create for the consumer? What's the value you're gonna create for the society? Only when you identify the value, then you're gonna have the, a lot of a chance to develop this uh, framework in a very uh, natural way. Yeah, probably there, there I think. Um, Go ahead, Rudy. Okay, please. I think there, there are also some traits to the organizations or institutions or process through which you work that enable and develop trust. And so that's a question of sometimes it's really openness. How much do people see and understand what's going on? You know, other times it's can you have a discussion in private and test out really 
difficult or potentially explosive ideas and try something new. And often when people and organizations are in a defensive mode, yeah. as you described, we as humans revert to the closed, exactly. secretive protection piece. And so I think a very conscious effort, especially in a connected society, uh, where uh, relations between customers and consumers are important and governments and citizens are, you know, are, are, are more connected. This very conscious question of, I, I feel this protective, be quiet, be secret, uh, what are and, and the right times to actually be open and invite discussion? Uh, one thing that the internet sort of life and society has done is make that more important, especially to younger generations that are accustomed to it. Mm -hmm. And so a very conscious effort of when to practice openness, when to be transparent, when to have discussions, when the leadership, um, sh uh, it's productive to really engage in a much more serious level of discussion than your basic defensive posture would suggest. Regan? Yes, um, I mean, talking about the next five years, you know, the, the, the business growth, I think I would like to go back to my business. And uh, so in the, in, it's, it's more vertical, more concrete uh, area. Um, I mean, the, for example, like the TV business, our business, um, it's going to be significantly changed, I think, in the, in the next five years because of the, uh, you know, the, the, the ongoing technical, you know, um, new, new development. Um, for example, like the smart TV. So that would be another, um, another wave to, to fundamentally change the whole chain of the TV business in the future. That's kind of an example to this question. For, um, because in the past, you know, the, the, the media landscape, the TV media landscape is we had, you know, terrestrial, we have cable, we had, uh, you know, a satellite as a transmission network. But going forward, internet would be open space for all the signal to spread. And, uh, and uh, the smart TV is kind of the combination, you know, uh, of hardware, software, and also content aggregation. So when you launch a smart TV, you play a lot of different roles, like you are a TV set manufacturer, you are a software designer, you are also a TV station aggregating contents and packaging contents, delivering contents. And also you deliver the product to, to the end users. So that's a full chain. It's a closed circle you can, you can manage. So that's the fundamental change of the business model of the TV business in the future. And it will create a lot of opportunities for the startup companies, for the content providers in the future. So I think that's the, you know, everything will, 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 will I mean, the, because the, 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 the infrastructure of the media landscape will be changed, then so many other things around will change, you know, accordingly, will be changed accordingly. Yeah. You know, Chung, oh, uh, Chung yeah. did you want to weigh in? Okay, yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Thank you, yes. First of all, I think we need to have confidence I read a lot of news and uh, coverage. In each and every industry, we are focused on innovation, investment and input in new ideas and research and development. Because the new business model will lead us through this economic crisis. So I think confidence is the most important thing and the most valuable thing. Two decades ago, we couldn't think of internet as so important in our society. And also, two decades ago, we couldn't think about some new industries propping up. However, during the economic transition, a lot of entrepreneurs and also enterprises will lead us and guide our way. So confidence is very important. And apart from this, we need to have the support and also inclusive environment so that we can really nurture innovation and also repeat that across the globe. So we're quite optimistic. Yeah, you raise a really important point, and I think one of the great themes of the last couple of days is collaboration. Now, innovation is enabling new types and forms of collaboration, and collaboration is enabling a new wave of innovation. And that can only continue in an environment of trust. And I think individuals have a role in that, businesses have a role of, 
in that, and also governments have a role in that, in ensuring that globally, when we collaborate, when we share information in new ways, when we create information in new ways, that we can trust that it will be used in an appropriate way. Uh, if that happens, I believe that we're going to see a, a new wave of innovation that is going to change lives for so many. You, you asked the question uh, at the start of this, uh, how do you build the trust that's necessary? Uh, and I think you know, trust is definitely something that's earned over time. Uh, but iteration uh, could be an important mindset for building trust. Let me explain. So technology innovation is usually the result of a lot of experimentation, even a lot of failure. It's, but what you learn from the failure and iteration eventually leads to a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And I think that same mindset could be applied to, to regulation, uh, which is uh, a mindset of experimentation, pilots, uh, trials, and some of those will be successful, some of them will not. Either way, we will learn, and as we learn, we will build trust. So I think, I think there could be some, um, some parallels from the innovation process applied to you know, that conversation about values and regulation. So it sounds like everybody's going to have to have a little bit more faith to start building that trust when you're talking about the government side. But it doesn't have to be blind or, faith, right? Yeah. It's more what is the process that will build the trust, build the confidence over time. And if you could outline that process at the beginning, uh, I, think, I think it would go a long ways. So just a building on that when you're talking about the importance of the environment that's created and that there's an inclusiveness or openness, are there certain countries that you, or parts of the world that you think will pull ahead in the next five years, 10 years, compared to others. Right now, we see that the West tends to dominate a lot of the innovation. Do you think that there's going to be a shift, or do you think it's still going to be dominated by a more Western uh, um, ideology? Hopefully, there's a shift. Hopefully, everybody becomes mm -hmm. the innovator. As, as innovation gets democratized, as the tools become uh, less expensive, um, and the networks become tighter, that uh, people around the world can be included in the process of innovation and, and, and collaborate together to achieve bigger things. Yeah, I agree with that. New, new efforts to bring internet access, for example, to Africa have the potential to dramatically raise the standard of living in that part of the world. And, and that actually raises the standard of living around the world because geopolitical stability is mm. fundamental to economic growth everywhere. Yeah, I, uh, I would support. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I would support that the uh, the innovation will become a more globalized, you know, activity, uh, given the uh, you know uh, faster changing technology, given the stronger and stronger network. Uh, all these you know um, uh, technologies and tools will help the people you know around the world. Actually, we can view the uh, uh, the global market as a single one, and you can actually you know in any you know, village in the, in the, in the, in, the, in Africa, you can expect uh, um, the people there, you know, uh, working on some very, in, you know, innovative te technologies and business model, and then that um, promote that through the, uh, you know, uh, global network. So I would say there will be a more globalized approach for innovation. There's two levels. One is where does innovation occur, in which we do, as mentioned. Um, both want and are aiming towards innovation everywhere. Tools, more people being able to innovate. There is also a related question that's come up a number of times at this event of building a global technology platform. And to what extent will global technology platforms be built outside of the West or Silicon Valley? Right. And, and that piece is both where innovation occurs, as, as Ken talked about, and also the nature of the environment. So, Building a technology platform in a very local environment or a very closed environment is difficult to then become global. Mm -hmm. And so, so I think we will see innovation in many more places to actually have global technology platforms come from all parts of the world, I think depends on what those parts of the world, what their market is like, mm -hmm. right? Is it, is it a market that is uh, living in, in an international setting you know, or is it a pretty local market? And something that's really successful locally, getting into a global market is a, is a different stage. Yeah, so I think, um, I'm, actually, I'm, I'm confident on, on, on this. Um, the current stage for China is uh, we are using this, uh, the market, market size or market consumption to exchange expertise. 
from outside. And uh, so, for example, we set up a joint venture with DreamWorks in Shanghai, you know, um, doing animation production. And uh, so we brought a lot of expertise, you know, experts there with their expertise to, to China. And uh, so you can see that there is a flow uh, with this best, you know, practice transfer happening in China between, you know, between two sides. And going forward, I think um, the local creativity will come up, will come up, and eventually. Um, the power base will be, ba will be built in, in China. And I think that will take some time. And the, the, the important thing is, um, it's not about just you know, some, some, some products exp exportation or importation. It's just about how you can locally set up a, a long-term sustainable system to continue you know, to create contents in the future. So that's, I, can, I, I think, that's quite important. Yeah, can I can I add something on, on the innovation uh, landscape? Uh, I believe that the technological platform will uh, provi uh, provide us a uh, a equal support for the in future innovation and make the uh, innovation a more globalized approach. However, the landscape of the innovation will highly rely on the regulatory situation yeah. from country to country. Right. So I believe that you know in a country where we can have more supportive you know, a regulatory situation, obviously the country will be in a more leading position in the, in the, in the future landscape. Mm -hmm. So I fully agree, our future innovation, so the power uh, will be more equal and also could be uh, recovered, uh, repli uh, replicate the result of innovation across the world. Look at uh, China's uh, situation. Many uh, graduate uh, students, so they want to find a job. But in China, the first thing they want to do, whether they can have uh, uh, innovation to have uh, entrepreneurships. So many uh, executives in our company, their idea is that in a new uh, area, want to uh, have a startup uh, company to have a uh, more innovation and uh, entrepreneurship. So actually, we have about uh, 10,000 uh, newly registered companies every day. So I believe this kind of uh, innovation will be more uh, inclusive and uh, spread to every part of the world. And uh, even maybe the emerging countries can be a big power of uh, innovation. And also the innovation in a certain area around the world. So normally it takes about uh, 10 years or five years, but now about uh, uh, 10 months or five months could be uh, uh, rapidly uh, localized and uh, replicated. So the speed of innovation in future and also the horizontal influence will be very uh, fast. Specifically, uh, what kind of policy and investment needs to be in place to really encourage the entrepreneurial environment right now. Definitely, we've heard already from the Chinese Premier talking about the importance of innovation, and there's been plenty of money that's put into it. What, what more do you want to see to make sure that the environment is conducive to getting all of those young entrepreneurs who you're talking about in, in a good place so that they can innovate? Um. So I believe, so uh, DD is about a three-year-old uh, company. So we have around uh, 8,000 RMB as the startup so three years ago, three years uh, later in China. So we are kind of a uh, uh, 1.5 billion US dollars uh, platform. So uh, at the beginning, so uh, it's difficult to imagine it could uh, happen. But uh, we have a lot of uh, similar cases in China, such a uh, support, we need both uh, uh, hard conditions and also the soft uh, soft uh, uh, environment support for the hard infrastructures. So we have a lot of uh, innovation uh, bases, the software park, a lot of uh, supportive uh, policies and uh, supportive uh, services, including the talent. So we try to uh, uh, reduce the threshold of the innovation. So you need a lot of preparations about 10 years ago for innovation, a lot of limitations of the infrastructure. But now if you have an idea, you can get the fund very uh, fast, as well as the talents, and also the cooperations or partners, like uh, payment and the traffic is more and more mature. Secondly, it's our software environment. So we try to uh, encourage the uh, innovation and also we can uh, really allow them to fail. So uh, 
this kind of uh, innovation will change our future's uh, culture. So we have a lot of uh, successful cases in China, in our internet area, that really stimulate uh, generations of the young people to be involved. I think another important uh, input here is uh, the right skills, uh, that the young people uh, have skills specifically in the science, technology, engineering, and math backgrounds. Mm. Uh, and I think that's something that uh, is done very well in China in terms of the absolute number of graduates and the relative percentage of graduates in these fields, but uh, it's something that uh, we certainly struggle with in the U.S. and, and elsewhere. And uh, as we talk about uh, having a bigger part of society participate in the innovation, and we talk about how there isn't uh, necessarily going to be enough jobs in the future, it really comes down to a question of, well, what skills do people have? Uh, because there is a shortage of, of these science, technology, engineering, math skills, uh, and I think that's a, a good area of focus. You were nodding. Just <laughs> agreeing. So the the um, other question, uh, I, maybe it's related both again to um, Cheng Wei as well as to, to you, Nathan. But you're both in you're both innovative businesses, and uh, who've uh, appear to be looking globally. So how do you, uh, how do you transform yourself from an innovative, an innovative business in one country and then globalizing? Uh, that almost happens uh, instantaneously now. And I think that's been a big change of the last maybe five or 10 years, which is the internet uh, makes this all one planet. Uh, you know, there's, there's no difference between uh, two people communicating over the internet inside the US versus uh, on the other side of the planet. And so, uh, so quickly you see this, this business models and content and, and all being transported. And in Airbnb's case specifically, uh, we were international from day one. And not because we had anybody focused on building out our international uh, uh, user base. Uh, it happened just simply because uh, as, we, as uh, there was writing about us publicity, people around the world saw that. They started signing up themselves. So very organically, this globalization and, and internationalization is happening now. And, and that wasn't true before when there wasn't such good connections. Um, so actually, so for quite a long time in the past, for China's uh, companies, uh, they serve some more local uh, Chinese uh, customers. So China is a big country and also a very complicated market. So we already have a lot of uh, challenges inside. So more is the uh, Chinese companies serve the Chinese uh, customer and the Western companies uh, serve uh, global customers. But we do see the trend recently, like uh, Huawei, like uh, Lenovo, those uh, Chinese uh, science uh, companies. They started to have a new position as an uh, international company, like uh, Lenovo, 70% of their businesses. Uh, comes not only from China, but from the whole world, which is the same true for Huawei. They have a lot of uh, global R&D centers. So changing from their positioning, so they look at themselves as an international company in terms of the talents, the technology reserves, and the business uh, coverage. They are moving uh, slowly to the global. So this is a trend for Chinese company for sure. We have a lot of uh, exploration in this area. Challenges, and I'm thinking of mainly because uh, when I look at e-commerce, for example, it seems as though there haven't been a lot of successful cases where an e-commerce company has been able to break out of their home country and then really succeed tremendously in another. There are some smaller, maybe, you know, some, uh, some limited success, but, it, but, but I'm wondering how do you, as an innovative company, you really doing well in your own country, how do you, how do you bring that model to another country and do really well? And that's why I was thinking about Airbnb. How do you come to, say, for example, China, and then really change the model so that you could do well? Is there, there are there conversations that you've had? Certainly, and that there are certain technical and business barriers. Um, yeah. You know, things like handling local payments. Uh, in the case of China, local uh, social networking uh, apps, uh, local app stores, you know, these are all things that require incremental work to support the native solution. I think the good news is so many companies are becoming more global that uh, there are now intermediaries that are taking the complexity out of that uh, and, and creating that connectivity so that not each company has to reinvent it, but there's an off-the-shelf solution that, that bridges these worlds together. Uh, you know, I think 
with technology, there's often a first mover advantage. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of the global companies have come out of the US simply because the US was uh, kind of a first mover on a lot of this internet innovation. Um, but you see that, I think, quickly changing, which is as we democratize the innovation, you see innovation happening elsewhere. Uh, and you see the cutting edge stuff now coming out of China or, or now India. Uh, I think you're going to start seeing global companies that were originated from different countries. It's not all going to be coming uh, from the US anymore. Yeah, can, can I, can I uh, ask something about the, uh, uh, actually the, the previous two questions are about the uh, innovation and the globalization. And I'd like to share some of my thoughts on, the, uh, on this topic. Actually, uh, compared with the DD and the Airbnb, we f focus more on the technological innovation because they're, I think, focus more on the business model innovation. Um, in our operation, I think the uh, innovation and the globalization are the two key considerations on the whole uh, strategy. Actually, uh, for Huawei, there are three stages uh, of our growth. But for the first stage, we are a purely uh, Chinese, China-based company. And for the sec second stage, we became an international company um, headquartered in China. We, we exp uh, export our products and the service and even human resources to the rest of the world and collect the money back. And now we globalized our operation more and more. And now we view that we are a global company. And in this process, um, you need to have a, firstly, you need to have a totally new mentality on your global operation. You need to view the global market as a, as a single one, and you, ne you need to view all the places um, that you know, you're gonna have the um, best talent people in all the possible you know, cities around the world, and you're gonna distribute your products and the service, and particularly to develop your technology in any possible places in the world. And secondly, you need to have some fresh you know, mindset in your daily operation. Firstly, you have to identify the best people around the world, and to build up your facility of research and development, you cannot just you know, get them to China, you have to get close to the talent people. Then, so, so as a result, we have already built up a global uh, research de development network. We have around 30 R&D institutions around the world, distributed in Europe, in the United States, in Africa, uh, uh, in uh, India, in China. And from the human resource perspective, you need to have a global view as well. You need to give all the employees in your organization the equal opportunity to let them you know, uh, create the value, to let them realize their dream. So from that end, you actually need to make the whole organization, I mean the Huawei, like a global platform to let all the people who really want to do something great, who really want to change the world, to join you and work here and then sh to share the benefits. So we call that as a mindset of the uh, Globalization. You need to have a global view, but you need to localize your you know, operation in any of the markets where you uh, deliver your service, where you conduct your uh, research and development activities. You know, the company that I lead was thrust into a potentially relevant learning on this front. Um, we were forced to start as a global company because when you operate satellites that are, are quite costly and are circling the Earth, uh, by definition, it's a global business from day one. Uh, you need to be global to make the numbers work. And I think what we've learned is that by starting to think globally day one, the chances of success in a world where network effects and first mover advantage and globalization are so important, uh, I, I believe is, is an important success factor. So didn't learn it on purpose. But we have learned it, and I think it's relevant for you know, many of the global growth companies that are here at World Economic Forum. How do you think funding innovation will change in the future? Do you think it's going to be mainly through VCs, or do you think that there are going to be new sources of capital, new ways to fund? What do you think? Well, there, there are. Um, new sources of capital, and this may be a, a controversial co uh, comment, uh, but I think that um, 
uh, some of the valuations that we're seeing uh, actually uh, may have uh, unpredictable consequences because uh, ultimately economics haven't changed. You, know, you need you know, revenue and profit and, um, and growth uh, all are part of a formula that ultimately creates economic value. So I think we need to, uh, you know, we need to pay attention to what's happening in capital markets. We also have to look through that to the fundamentals of the businesses that uh, many here in this room are investing in. I think uh, what's become clear is uh, there's no shortage of money for good ideas. Uh, and so, you know, as there's more innovation, I think the funding will materialize. I think what you're seeing is uh, there, there aren't as many places where you can invest your money and get a good return. And so you have a lot of different types of investors uh, who have money who are looking for a way to maximize return. Uh, and I don't know exactly what that will look like, um, but I think it's being driven by this desire to find returns, uh, and a lot of it is going to come from the innovation that, that's going to happen. Yeah, I think the, although the, the, you know, the recently the uh, stock, stock market, you know, become quite volatile, um, the, I mean, the, the funding for the, for, for, the, for the startup company in China is still very active. And the reason is, you know, you can still can, you know, you can see the confidence in for the for the for the innovation and for the creativity for the future, and uh, one thing I can see in this market is there will be more and more uh, cross-board investments. You know, looking at this, you know, technology technology-wise, and also um, some other new application-wise. So, um, for example, recently we look at a company in U.S. Uh, doing the VR technology. You know, virtual reality technology. The reason is because we see this technology will be another big change, you know, game changer for the, for the future and for the, for, the whole, for the whole media entertainment industry. That's a, you know, emerging technology. So the, um, we invest into that company, you know, then we use this market as a, you know, for them to practice, to, to test the market in this country. And eventually both sides, you know, the people can work together to come up with the new, new applications for, for, for both markets. So those kind of the models, patterns, I think going forward will, will happen you know, continually. What do you think the source of the next disruption will be? Data. Mm -hmm. Data. Data. There is a un unbelievable wave of data that's being created. Uh, that combined with uh, storage costs coming down and the availability of inexpensive computing power. Mm -hmm. The combination of those three uh, is going to unleash all sorts of insights, all sorts of game-changing products, and, and that's exciting. Yeah, I believe that's uh, uh, artificial intelligence which is also based on the, on, on the data. And for the artificial, I think the artificial intelligence will help us to, to make the world more intelligent, smarter, and more efficient. And in order to achieve the um, artificial intelligence, because we, we already had a lot of discussion and demo here in, in Summer Davos for the artificial intelligence, uh, we will need to have a lot of you know, innovation in big data, storage and analytic, and we, we also need to do a lot of innovation in the related you know, technology areas like the uh, communication technology, like the sensing technology. So, but I'm pretty sure that that will be a, the next uh, you know, big disruption. I think there's, yeah. also, Sorry. Yeah. there's also a disruption coming in physical things and in the production and creation and distribution of physical items as we we learn, ju just as the, the internet moves data around and makes it global, we're learning how to build and print and make devices more locally as well. And I think um, we've had a big centralization, uh, industrial revolution centralized techniques for creating things, and not as quickly as data, but 
not too far after, we'll start to see those effects happen in physical things as well. So you're talking about the manufacturing part? Yes. As well as yes. the physical products? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, to, build, yeah. to build off the manufacturing part, I think 3D printing is super exciting uh, because uh, it's going to allow complex systems, uh, like a, a, an increase in the complexity of things that are being built. Uh, it's going to allow uh, that to be happen faster and uh, ultimately that will mean cheaper. It's going to allow for more uh, iterating and experimentation. Uh, and I think already there's incredible things uh, being done. You know, uh, Elon Musk is 3D printing uh, a rocket engine. I mean, that's yeah. insane. Uh, normally a rocket engine would require so many different individual components that would have to be handmade and put together very precisely. Now, you know, you can just 3D print this thing uh, over and over again. It's incredible. Yeah. 3D printing of heart monitoring equipment as well. Mm. Right. So, and also the distribution channels may change pretty dramatically as well. I fully agree that uh, technical level we have many breakthroughs like big data, artificial intelligence and gene technologies. We also note that uh, from the previous ownership technology and uh, we all work for the ownership of something like a car, a house, or something else. Now we are moving to a new era, and we are faced with some bottleneck, and we are moving to a shared economy. Individual ownership is not possible for everyone, and uh, such ownership will result in constraints of resources. So we are promoting from the ownership shift to a shared ownership, like the DD Taxi hailing app. We hope that uh, with the internet technology, with the shared economy, and we can reorganize the resources by the better caring of customers at the terminals, we can provide you a better consumer experience, even better than the ownership experience. We know that in the recent period, period of time, the vehicle plate numbers are restricted on certain days. But we have less traffic and better traffic conditions, although some of the cars are restricted to be on the road and many people have the couple and other ways to solve the mobility request. Yes, I, I agree. I mean, the, the shared economy and also the super connective, con connectivity would you know, change the, you know, the life of the human beings mm -hmm. for a long run. And I think, especially for this country, I think uh, because of internet, especially this social internet, will significantly change the organization of the whole society and to mobilize the more resources, you know, much more you know, efficient than before. So that will be a big change you know, going forward. Is there any one industry that, that looks as though it's poised for upheav upheaval more so than any other, just because there hasn't been a big change in that industry, from your perspective? I think automotive is the one that stands out when Which one? Uh, automotive by the time we get oh. to the place where we have self-driving cars that have gone mainstream you know I think that will turn a lot of things upside down and create amazing opportunities to uh, to reclaim uh, road space uh, and to decrease congestion and decrease pollution um, but that's just going to be a huge societal shift and there's many players who have invested heavily uh, into infrastructure uh, and into automotive, and, and that's just going to be different uh, at some point in the future. I think he spoke a word I want to speak. And it seems that uh, we don't need to share the kitchen with someone else. We don't need to share our clothes with someone else. Uh, you know, share your clothes with someone naked. But we can share something public. For example, the vehicle sharing. It's not uh, the cost of the manufacturing of automobiles too big or uh, too high. However, because 
then the road in the cities were initially designed not for so many people. And we also see the car plate restriction or even the restriction to the purchase and the ownership of the automobiles with some car parking fees and other aspects. But the essential thing is to experience a better service provided by the third party better than your own self. So that will decrease the incentives to own a car or other activities. It's not necessary to 100% ownership of vehicle for only 50% of the usage. And when you drive, you don't do anything else. And uh, when you have the chauffeur service, uh, you can continue your activity on other aspects, for example, telephone making or uh, other business handling. So that is the upcoming shared economy. I, I would say um, <laughs> the health industry is poised for immense changes uh, with personalized medicine, yeah. Uh, data collection, ability for each one of us to actually get more information without needing to go to the doctor, the, the range of devices and understanding, not to mention gene therapy. So that has a highly regulatory component that's also very local, which will be under stress as well. But hopefully, you know, within our, you know, our lifetimes, the nature of healthcare and how we understand ourselves will be radically different. Yeah, my point is that Actually, uh, yeah, I'm from the ICT industry. I always believe that the first innovative things should be happen here in our industry because we are the enabler for everything for, for, for any of the you know innovation of technologies and, and business model. So we will you know provide the super fast network in the in the, in the next in the next couple of years to enable thousands of billions of connections. And beyond that, we're going to provide the super uh, computing capability running on the cloud base, and we're going to provide a variety of formats of uh, you know, devices, not just a smartphone, but a lot of you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, format of device with much much stronger um, function and probably lower cost. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's the industry that will experience greatest change, but the one that I'm most optimistic about benefiting from a lot of what's going on is education, oh. and it's fundamental because if we can educate our children around the globe using these new technologies, it becomes a, a self-reinforcing, very positive cycle that really does make the world a better place. Yeah, yeah for, you know, for my business, I think you know, everything can be changed you know, because of the new technology. But one thing is still will be long-term sustainable, which is imagination, people's imagination. Yeah. Well, OK, so we know there's going to be a disruption in in the automotive industry, healthcare, education, and behind it all is going to be Huawei making all the changes with the cloud computing and everything else. Um, so just uh, looking forward, I wanted to ask all of you if your daughter, son, if a friend of yours came over and then they introduced you to their 12-year-old, and the 12-year-old said to you, I really want to be in your industry. What do I need to do to prepare myself, how would you position them? What, would, what advice would you give to them about the future? Should they be in your industry? Should they not be in your industry? Should they be in the ICT part of the industry? Or should they be in the mobile part? Should they decide, no, I, I'm not going to do, you know, it's not good for me to be in imaging. Or, you know, what, 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 what do you think is actually the future in your own industry? What would you tell them? Well, you mentioned the age 12. I mean, I think that is kind of the right age to target. Me, myself, I learned how to code starting at the age of 12. And so I think never underestimate the potential of a young person and their appetite to learn. It's just a question of how to engage them. Um, but increasingly, uh, because of the internet and, and the connectivity, uh, all that educational material is available. And hopefully we can have some innovative models for further engaging a, a broader audience uh, into this. But yeah, I think once, once you have them engaged, it's, it's a lesson in, in making sure that a young person is always challenging themselves, always learning. Uh, and there was an idea the other day that was tossed out, which is why does, why does most education end at the age of 21 or 22? I mean, why isn't there a lifelong learning? 
uh, and you know, maybe that's one way in which education will be dis disrupted. Um, but I think we all have to retrain ourselves and, and realize that uh, things aren't going to stand still anymore. Things are going to move faster and faster. Uh, and so uh, we need to get out of our comfort zone uh, and get in the mindset of, of constantly learning. I don't know uh, what advice to give about 20 years from now, what skills will be relevant. Uh, I do know uh, it's going to change a lot between now and then. And, and the only thing I can say right now is uh, develop a mindset of, of always, always learning. In addition to learning, I think another important skill that will last a lifetime is how to work with other people from diverse backgrounds. Because in this collaborative economy, this collaborative technology that's creating and the breakdown of boundaries, the ability to work with people from different parts of the world, different backgrounds, different religions, is going to be so important for today's young people. And, and I would add to that, I think for the 12-year-old daughter, there's uh, an additional, well, there's just an additional problem, which is somehow or other, she needs to be able to be the only girl or woman in her setting and function. Like, that needs to change, but if you ask me today, it hasn't changed. And so there's learning to work with diversity, but for the daughters and the women, it's how to be the only one, and maybe there's two of you, and how not to be the aggressive or two, whatever it is. And so there is a layer of um, figuring out, like there's a practice layer for daughters of being the only girl, being the only woman, like figuring out how to make it work. And that's something that we don't teach, and I think the standard diversity uh, of teams is, has, has a little ways to go on that one. And so that, well, thank you. <laughs> but anyway, so those are not things that, you know, like a 12 or 13 year old typically does, is find the group that's not like you, that is not maybe adjusting to meet you, and figure out how to be successful in it. Or, you know, what kind of changes you need. And, and then you can actually build a really diverse and broader, uh, more inclusive setting. Yeah, that might be a, a good topic for my uh, conversation with my daughter's uh, older Vika. <laughs> Actually, uh, they are uh, enthusiastic you know, consumer of the digital media. They are a big fan of uh, Airbnb and, uh, and, 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 and DD. But if they're going to you know, work in my industry, in the ICT industry, I would suggest that, yeah, probably all your friends going, are going to be uh, you know, working in an innovative company or uh, in, in, a, in a disruptive company like you know, DD, like you know, uh, Airbnb, but I would encourage you to be the enabler of the disruptor. Because <laughs> yeah, the ICT industry is actually at the position as the enabler for all the you know, disruption. But in order to be an enabler, you have to firstly to keep an open mind. You have to be curious enough to learn you know, what, what is happening in all the industries. And particularly, you need to put yourself into the shoes of the different industries and to learn what the consumer really wants and to learn what are the real value you can create together with your inter industry partners for the consumers. So into, you, you need to be very open. You need to be good at learning. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the skills and the capabilities they need to have. I, I actually I do agree. Uh, agree. I mean, um, um, if if I would you know give the kind of instruction to younger generation, younger people, I think um, you know keep hungry, keep keep a heart of curiosity, would be very important for for their future career. And uh, because currently in this world, I mean, the speed of change is quick, much quicker than expected. So. Just keep your every keep your heart open. Keep the correct curiosity. That's the maybe the 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 the, the, the smart way to keep moving. Did you want to weigh in? If for a 12 If for twelve-year-old to get into my business, to give him suggestions first, I congratulate him. He did not need to take a driver license test. Secondly, and he does not need to consider he has to have a car in the future. Oh, no, he should have a car, and uh, he would like to share with other people together. This share economy will get into his blood, and if he wants to get into my business, 12 years is too young. 
I believe a 12-year-old should uh, try to learn more and uh, to be open, to be curious, and to understand a diversified cultural cultures. And when it's time for him to select his career, and he should try to achieve his dream. First, he understand what his dream is, and then stick to it, and then try to realize that. No future for the next generation. That you have to make sure that you keep learning, that you're curious that you're open, that you're flexible, that you move fast, that, or you could be the very clever one behind all the disruptors who's powering it all. <laughs> so um, anyway, I want, just want to say thank you so much for, for all your time and your insights and for wrapping everything up today. And I want to thank all of you for staying as well. Thank you very much.